Hello and welcome to 81 All Out. This is your host, Siddhartha Vaidyanathan, and I would like to thank you for taking the time out to listen to this podcast. We are a crowdfunded endeavor, and you can support us at coffee.com. That's K O hyphen F I dot com slash 81 All Out to keep the show going. Hello and welcome to the latest episode of the 81 All Out podcast. This is Siddhartha Vaidyanathan at Sidvi on Twitter. And uh, today I have with me someone who has had a ringside view of the workings of a T20 franchise over uh, quite a few years now. Um, as a format, uh, T20 is rapidly evolving from season to season. And uh, so I wanted to speak to someone um, who can enhance my understanding of this sport and also give me an idea of the direction in which it is moving. So a warm and hearty welcome to uh, Hassan Chima from Lahore. Uh, hey, man. Has- hey, Hassan. Uh, thanks for joining. Hassan has been on the show before. Uh, we spoke about the mighty 1990s Pakistan team <laughs> when Hassan was here earlier. Uh, but this time we are going to go a slightly different route. Hassan has worn various hats in his time in cricket. He's a terrific cricket writer and an analyst. In fact, uh, my introduction to Hassan was as a cricket writer uh, back uh, you know, in the early 2010s, maybe even slightly before that. Uh, but after that, he has moved on to other roles as well. He is uh, a part of the Islamabad United uh, franchise in the Pakistan Super League. He has been a talent scout. He continues to be a talent scout and a strategy manager. And uh, so, hi, Hassan. Welcome. How is everything going for you? Yeah, all good, man. All good. As you mentioned that I am a cricketer. I think that the more appropriate word would be I was a cricket writer. Not really uh, write that much anymore. Well, uh, writing occasionally pulls you in, I think. I think once in a while you still write a, about Pakistan cricket. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it, it's, it's sort of like, you know, you laugh back into it after a while. You, you can check out, but you can never leave, Hassan. That's yeah, yeah pretty much. <laughs> so when you started working uh, in this T20 and now, you know, is it like, uh, you know, tell me like the fun, like a few basic changes. I mean, the sport has evolved. I mean, it's evolving so rapidly. I'm sure, uh, you know, the uh, T20 that you saw back then uh, seems vastly different from what it is today. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's like every year there's something new. Plus the other thing is, uh, when we started off, Rehan, who's sort of my partner in uh, with Islamabad United, he was with me beforehand as well. We, when we started off, like even I think back to PSL 1, which would be 2016, even back then, uh, what we were doing, the sort of analytics, the sort of numbers that we were using, I mean, those seem pretty ancient by now. But at that stage, even this is like five years ago, even at that stage, that seemed to be effective. But now you see like every year, uh, it's sort of like every, all of the other franchises have pretty much reached the stage or gone beyond the stage that we were at PSL1. So you have to uh, consistently be, try to be one step ahead. And it's not just that you're competing with the other five franchises in PSL. It's sort of like not really competing, but like you learn from franchises around the world. You look at, say the England national team or the West Indies and you try to incorporate as much of what they're doing as possible. You look at uh, Perth, Scotches was a, a template that a lot of teams used uh, back when Justin Langer was their coach. And right now everyone obviously wants to look at Mumbai Indians as well. So it's like you try to get as much information, as much of what other teams are doing as possible. Everyone wants to protect that, but also like you pretty much got the same players going all around the world. So you can get information from them. You talk to people running other franchises uh, around the world and you get to learn from them. And remember in PSL 1, we had a game, I guess I think it was Peshawar and uh, Saeed Ajmal was with me and we were defending a score. And I remember him mentioning to me back then that we need just needed to get the run rate to, I think, 10s and over. 
10 runs per over. And if we could get that, then uh, we were pretty much owning and controlling the game because 10 per over at that stage seemed like everyone then aims to head out. Everyone then goes hard at every ball. And that's how you uh, are able to defend scores. And this would be like, what, February 2016? And by like a couple of months later was the... Barely a month later, I think four or five weeks later was the uh, World T20. And I remember talking to Andre Russell about the India West Indies, the semi final of the World T20. After that game, had a chat with him before the final. And him mentioning back then, uh, I because throughout that chase that West Indies had, uh, the run rate was consistently uh, over 10 and over. And I remember talking to him and him, him saying that. Tens are not a problem. Your aim should be to keep the run rate under 12 and over. As long as it's under 12, but it doesn't go beyond 12, then you are controlling the chase, which is what they did. I think in that entire chase, there was only one ball that the required rate get, uh, went over 12 and over. What somebody like Sayyid Ajmal, who dominated the game in like the late 2000s, early 2010s, what his... Uh, methodology was and compared that to uh, guys like the, that great West Indies team of the mid-2010s, uh, that entire generation, how they were almost like dragging the entire sport along. Like if you wanted to know, if you wanted to learn how to play this game, you had to learn from the West Indies and everything that pretty much every franchise is doing right now, it pretty much comes down to trying to emulate that team. Yeah, I mean, actually, uh, I, and I think they don't get much credit for it at all. You know, even today, yeah. there are commentators talking about the heyday of West Indies and the <laughs> great test team and all. But the fact remains, West Indies revolutionized test cricket. They revolutionized one-day cricket in the 80s and uh, ni early 90s. And they have revolutionized T20 to a uh, zone that, uh, you know, nobody can even imagine. But the fact is, it seems like they instinctively understood early on that it was a different sport, right? Because as you say... Uh, even until like 2014, 15, maybe even a little later, people were still looking at T20 through the prism of cricket. You know, one-day cricket, yeah. trying to trying to sort of extrapolate lessons <laughs> from one-day cricket and compress it to T20. But it's a totally different thing. It's very obvious now. It's a different sport. Yeah, absolutely. The first thing I think the, when I started working, I've always had this belief that we've always... In cricket, we've always had this conservative mentality of like whether it comes to T20 cricket or whether it comes to anything in cricket, really, that you try to emulate what uh, is existing rather than uh, thinking anew, which is, I mean, the, the thing with that West Indies team, obviously, they don't get the credit they deserve. It's also because a lot of their innovations were, uh, uh, all, a lot of the things that they did were uh, also intuitive, but also... They were also like, they were ahead of the game. They were smarter than everyone else when it came to T20 cricket. And that's just not a narrative that uh, is shared in cricket commentary or cricket writing circles. And there's like a lot of, you know, racial discourse that <laughs> goes into that as well. Oh, like the Caribbean uh, swagger and power and all that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah swagger yeah. and power and like beast and... Uh, yeah, and even that famous talent. Mark Nicholas, uh, you know, Fopa before that final t yeah. that World T20. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, so that's the thing. Like, the thing with the West Indies, I've worked with a lot of the guys that were part of that team. You think about that team, them using Samuel Badri as a power play specialist, the role that Sunil Narayan had, the way that Chris Gale pretty much revolutionized the way how an anchor can play where he could go like three to four overs without scoring a run right at the start just to get in because he knew he could cover that up, that sort of thing. And like, there's a lot of stuff that if you look at that West Indies team and how they played, the way they chased, for instance, and like I remember even back in 2016, uh, we were the, we were pretty adamant on getting like, uh, getting to chase, which was also something that we uh, saw the West Indies doing. And I remember... Uh, Crick Wiz had the stat in this PSL earlier this year, which was that I think 149 uh, T20 teams had won at least 20 tosses. And there was only one who uh, elected to do the same thing on every single one of those occasions, which was us at Islamabad United, where we elected to chase 100% of the times that 
uh, we won the toss and I think 22 22 matches right and uh, you were elected to field each time 22 times you won the toss I think yeah. after this year I think it's 24 and our success rate and chase success rate is over 80% because like that's your plan A and like your plan A has to be still not and we have never been a great uh, side defending uh, scores but like our plan A is always to uh, chase and we uh, when we started doing that back in 2016 even in 2017 a lot of people questioned that and there was still that uh, critic, cricketing uh, mindset of runs on the board and all that stuff and now you look at it this year before the postponement there were 14 games in the PSL and every single team elected to chase then you saw the England India series five matches in on all five occasions the the team that won the toss elected to chase. And I think the norm going forward is going to be the teams will elect to chase and how uh, teams will uh, constitute uh, their 11 so that they can defend scores. I think that will be the thing that the next thing that everyone needs to learn from, I guess. Uh, do you think that uh, then given the uh, nature of this toss and given the preference that overwhelming preference that teams have and will continue to have, do you think then it makes sense to... Uh, you know, ch- uh, tweak it, uh, the team, uh, announce the teams after the toss rather than before. Because, you know, picking a team for defending and picking a team for chasing seem to be two different ball games altogether. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. I, I feel like there is still this, uh, there is this, still this chink in this entire strategy, which is that however, whatever the pitch is, whatever the conditions are, it's very rare for the team chasing to be the disadvantageous uh, team on either front. Like, I feel like the only way, the only reason that you would bat first would be if it's like a, it's a day game and it's a spin pitch. So you, you expect by the second innings, the pitch will slow down further or it will spin more than uh, it will in the first innings. That's the only reason that you would uh, probably bad first or if you're of the uh, the belief that you've got a bowling attack which, which is way stronger than your batting which means that you rely on them to win your games but more often than not I will see this even during this IPL as well going forward that teams will over and over again elect to chase because that is especially the the next stage the guys who are like 20, uh, 25 and under right now the guys who pretty much the T20 generation, they're so much more used to chasing because the advantage that you have is uh, when you're batting first, you don't know what the par score is. You don't know. You can have all your data, but like uh, considering what the pitch will be, what the conditions will be, it takes a few hours for you to understand those. You might have like four days of uh, a par score of 160 and then one day you have a flat wicket and uh, you might come in with a strategy of go- uh, trying to get 160 and it might be a 200 pitch. You might end up with 180, 190 and the opposition chases down easily. So I think the having the deciding the team after the toss is perhaps the easiest solution to that. But even that requires a lot of uh, you know t- back and forth because the central issue in cricket right now is that we still want to uh, have cricket as, have T20 cricket as like another form of cricket. We don't consider it another sport at, until there is a collective realization that it should be uh, thought of like that. It should be thought of as a completely separate sport. It's sort of like the a rugby union, rugby league sort of a difference. And it used to be bad back when, say, Sonny Bill Williams or Roger Takiri would. Uh, transfer from rugby league to rugby union. It'll be, it'll, they'd say that he'd take one season to get used to it, or sometimes even more than one season, and then they'd get back and uh, get into the national team. And now with cricket, you're like, we'll have a four day game uh, which finishes on Sunday, or a, five, a test match that finishes on Monday, and by like Thursday and Friday, you'll have a T20 game. And uh, I still feel like we're not maximizing the players and the talent that cricket has just because of the way we schedule series and stuff like that. Yeah, and also, I mean, uh, I feel like, you know, there's also this whole uh, fundamental shift between like this uh, bilateral T20 and franchise T20, right? Because those two, again, are uh, completely different ball games <laughs> because a franchise uh, approaches uh, games quite differently. And what is a three-match T20 series, two-match T20 series? Because there's nothing really there. 
uh, yeah. for uh, teams. So they just uh, probably experiment and try and uh, get the best out of the individual performances, right? Yeah, and it also becomes like any youngster that you want to uh, uh, debut, anyone that you want to see with the national team. Uh, you bring them into the camp, and you always give them uh, a T Twenty game to start off with. And then, then there's also the issue of if he performs well in that bilateral T Twenty, a lot of teams then transfer them into like the longer formats, which is again like that is a, a much longer debate, much longer discussion. <clears throat> to have uh, which I mean I feel like there's there's a lot of things that people sort of uh, still don't understand or still don't reconcile reconcile with the how uh, the T20 format is and again it all comes back to the people running cricket are still those uh, whether that's coaches or whether that's administrators who still see T20 either as a cash cow or as subservient to the other two formats whereas even the i was mentioning the west indies earlier a lot of their success also had to do with the way the cpl was played a lot of the stuff that came through into the west indies national team came through because of something that was happening in the cpl we've seen this uh, in the ipl as well like the usage of data is a lot more prevalent because uh, franchises have a different perspective towards that than a uh, cricket board would one of the uh, problem seems to be that uh, the, there isn't that many games because even in a franchise even in a franchise like IPL you know where a team plays 14 <clears throat> games or uh, uh, you know uh, that they play or and then they will play the have the playoffs uh, it's still you know too few to actually draw like a proper conclusion or to get a proper trend like in you know you're comparing it to say baseball where they have 160 yeah. games in the season So course, uh, the noise point seems to be much higher with a T20 franchise at league. It's it's not even just that. I mean, there's all, always the issue of sample size. But like with sample size, you can still have like a lot of the uh, T20 specialists around the world, the freelance players that you have. They always have a larger sample size because they play three or four leagues. So you even for a year you have like thirty to forty games. Even last year you look at. through all the problems that we had with covid somebody like rashid khan still played like over 30 games a lot of the pakistan guys because we had national t20 and the psl so they played like a bunch of them played 25 30 games so you can still have uh, that sample size on players but in basketball or in baseball you it's uh, every game it's sort of like a repeatable sort of thing but in cricket like uh, that in this format Uh, and how the game will be played what the power score will be uh, how a team needs to proceed and all of that comes down to how the pitch plays i was looking at the numbers like in 10 of the 13 ipl seasons uh, csk have had their spinners in the middle overs have gone at under 7.5 and over so that's what 10 out of 13 seasons basically means that going at under 7.5 and they didn't even play over, two seasons by the way they didn't even oh, play two <laughs> Uh, yeah, yeah, of course. So that would be what then eight out of eleven seasons. Yeah. yeah. So there were only three seasons where they went at over eight, seven point five, not even eight. Like one of them was last year when they didn't have any home games. So when they they're playing at home, they're basically like, not even this year will be a little different because of the different doubles and like how the venues are used. But that was one of the things. Like you looked at somebody like uh, KKR or. Uh, sunrises to a lesser extent but especially mumbai they always you could see they were ahead of the game but then you look at looked at chennai and they did, even if they didn't have the data their understanding of how t20 cricket is played like they had like what half a dozen 40 year olds in every team that they played so they understand t20 more than most and you could see that how they could apply that and they could pretty much nullify so many teams just by having surfaces that Uh, made it an even game where a lot of hitters, a lot of elite hitters, sort of get neutralized when once you get to the sort of pitch where Imran Tahir and uh, Mitchell Santner and these guys can dominate. Yeah, and I think that comes down to considering a different sport, right? I mean, because it's still seen through the cricketing prism, people are thinking that you know the pitch is an integral part of the game, but uh, you know if it has to become, uh, if it has to be optimized to. the extent to which you want to play it then you need to make sure the a certain standardization comes in with the pitch because that's the only way in which teams can then 
you know start worrying about the game itself rather than worry about the mm-hmm. conditions and the spinning and the, all these conditions Uh, yes and no i mean that that would make my job easier but it's also like if i am running a team if i if i am in say running an ipl team i would have precisely that strategy which was what csk had or what sunrisers had like i think it was 2016 or 17 when they had mustafi shakib and rashid all three together and they could get 150 up on the board and they'd still win matches because they have the uh, a pitch where the, a, a big enough ground it is the sort of pitch that you uh, could defend 150 with like uh, quality spin and that's i feel like i'm with the psl because like four of the seasons were in the uh, uae and even last year the pitches were still controlled by the pakistan cricket board but i feel like that's that is going to be a thing because you want standardization because it helps you with the sample size the data and everything but at the end of the day everyone wants to win and the best way to win is if especially if you're an asian side is to have the sort of pitch that pretty much neutralizes uh, like an aussie or a south african or stuff like that like i remember even like 2 3 years ago this was i think 28 end of 2018 pakistan had this uh, series in the uae against uh, australia where uh, australia pretty much brought the very best of the big bash guys like darcy short and chris lynn and basically everyone glen maxwell and i think australia crossed like 120 like once in three matches because they they had imad wasim or they had like spinners bowling in the middle with like so dubai uh, the dubai pitch was like typical dubai which didn't allow any fluent stroke play and i remember even one game they australia were like six down within the par play because everyone wanted to play through the line and there are certain pitches that don't allow that even if you look at last year i was of the 50 highest run scores in the ipl last year like 23 or 24 of them went at under 8 and over because even with like sharja slightly skewing the numbers like with dubai and abu dhabi even the the best hitters in the world were su- su- suddenly they seemed mortal because just because of how dubai and abu dhabi play that's a, that's the spice of t20 you if just if it's just a hitathon i don't think that's going to appeal to a lot of the audience or to like people running franchises because there's no real challenge in that then okay so just tell me this then okay so now we've uh, it's pretty clear that you know most teams prefer to chase and that's probably going to be the trend going forward so suppose your team uh, is put into bat you know they're batting mm-hmm. first so what what is it so you don't have i mean obviously you have the data to tell you what a par score could be but at the yeah. same time how do you approach this whole batting first thing because uh, you know do you start going from ball one do you give it some time what what is the general trend that you're noticing i i don't think lahore aside there's no team that's been bowled out more often that for like 100 less than 140 than we've been because we've had this belief since like uh, the first couple of seasons of the psl that you'd rather uh, aim to shoot for the stars and get out at like 125 130 rather than on a flat pitch getting 150 150 i yeah sure it might be good for the net run rate but the best way to play if you're sent in first is to try to whatever the par score is try to uh, shoot way beyond that we don't have an anchor up top we have three guys up top who are just uh, who have got like complete license to go out there and bang and if you lose like three or four early wickets only then we usually have like a middle order anchor like we used to have misbah back in the day uh, the first three seasons for instance or like somebody like ian bell we had in psl4 sometimes you might not need him but if you do if you're like three down after the end of the par play then you need him to get to the par score i remember when we won psl3 uh, misbah actually missed the playoffs but even before that he was almost playing as a specialist captain which was he would uh, we didn't have any top order collapses so He, uh, there was no need for him to bat thankfully he didn't have any issues with it but like that's the other thing like you're dealing with like 18 human 18 or 20 or 21 human beings who put their careers on the line and like this is uh, especially if it's a psl this is a chance for a lot of them to either cement their place in the national team or like get get into the national team and if you're a foreign player you also want to still have this reputation where you, if you perform well here you'll have better contracts elsewhere so it's sort of weird in that way that you have to manage 
all of those expectations all of those uh, mindsets as well as having like you know the the i mean you mentioned baseball earlier and i feel like the advantage that those guys have is like the the distinction between the guys running the team and the individuals actually playing the the battle between them has pretty much been sorted out by now it's it's pretty clear who runs those franchises right and that's not a thing that's going to be solved in t20 cricket even within the next few years yeah so that's that brings me to actually uh, some points here so one point that i wanted to bring is that you mentioned in um, i think uh, you know an interview uh, for a piece that tim wigmore had written about uh, how you are looking primarily at islamabad united is looking at situations and not at batting numbers and how you don't really worry about set batting numbers and don't go with specialists for each spot but you are basically allowing you know floating them wherever you please and i think uh, you know shadab khan uh, was really successful as well when he was pushed up the order and all that but yeah. somebody that has grown up in cricket you know like uh, test uh, first class cricket test cricket i mean how does that reconcile with those players because uh, then it will require them to you know be so agile mm-hmm. that may be against their instinct to start with so how do you sort of uh, deal with that like we went from like i think in psl 1 we had a game with like our second last round robin game with uh, right before the game the broadcaster put the stat up that we had the one of the 10 oldest teams that had ever played a t20 game we had like we still had azad mehmood we still had mispa we had brad harden we had shane watson we had all these guys who were like uh, samuel badri who were like uh, t20 stalwarts and then by like last season we had a team where which was i think three on average three years younger than the second youngest team in the uh, psl and the reason for that was with a lot of guys who were like established players trying to get those ideas trying to get that mindset across of where your score doesn't matter where your wicket essentially doesn't matter in a lot of situations that where you have to sacrifice yourself for the team that sort of thing like a lot, a lot of guys are still conservative about that like established players where if you have a youngster coming through you can inculcate them in that ideology so now we've come to a stage where our core guys are pretty much guys who play the way that we want to play even like uh, we have a, we had a game this year we were chasing down 200 against karachi we we'll, uh, we sent in shadab we uh, sent in shadab usually at number 3 or number 4 as sort of like a quasi sunil narayan sort of role where the value of the wicket isn't that much but the uh, whatever he can provide that can be an added bonus and like he can play at fifth gear sixth gear every ball knowing that his wicket doesn't really have that big a price on it so he uh, got out with like we were like 14 for 2 after like two overs or in the third over and alex hayes was batting the normal ticketing perspective would be to send because you've lost two wickets in the first 10 15 balls you want to go and like consolidate there so you send in the proper batsman and even without telling your shadab who was who got out and why he was uh, coming out he stopped the batsman who was going into bat stopped him and sent in fahim ashraf as like uh, even at number 4 as someone who is just there to almost like a pinch hitter sort of role and fahim ended up getting like 25 or 15 we had a power play we got like 70 plus and then the batsman could just come in and go at like 8 and over and just to chase it down uh, like with an over to spare guys who come through just in the t20 era the way they think the way they approach cricket is it's it's refreshing and it's so much more different than Uh, what had come before you, you look at somebody like the way rishabh pant bats is you look at, you looked at it, the way he batted in australia the way he batted against england in the home series even in the test game no no that's true absolutely and uh, no doubt about it mike uh, i'm curious about the measures of excellence though because uh, mm. you know for a for a shadab or for a sunil narayan you know they have little to lose with the bat because they know that their spot is pretty much guaranteed because they have it with yeah. the ball and even rishabh pant if you decide to pick him as a wicket keeper there is a certain mm. bit of freedom for him but yeah. as a specialist batsman uh, you know traditionally of course the measures of excellence is runs and average and all that but that is all out of the window here yeah. how do you then uh, tell a batsman you know and how do you inculcate in him that 
you know, how do you, what do you measure at the end? Is it game by game? At the end of the season, what are you looking at? Are you looking at strike rate? Are you looking at something like, uh, you know, attempted hits? Or uh, can you tell us a bit about the metrics that come in there? Considering the state of the Pakistan national team as well, a lot of the Pakistan guys still want to play for themselves and still want to play for the way the to get into the national team and just trying to remove that mindset is a constant battle as well. But the way you look at it is, A, firstly, it's this game-by-game game thing. So you have every uh, match, you have like a given role to a guy. Like uh, you might say like uh, the required rate or like the aim that you're, uh, what you're aiming for is like nine and over. So uh, that's a strike rate of 150. So even if you go at like 140, is that a below power score? That's a, uh, that's an understanding that you have to make every game, every situation. You have to uh, see whether someone fulfilled his role essentially or not. That's the first thing. The second thing is end of the tournament. Uh, what you have to look at is uh, what his overall numbers are and what his overall impact is and how much did you need someone and how much value in terms of like dollars to performances that uh, you had. Like you look at somebody like uh, Colin Ingram, we had last year and we, he was, apart from Dale Stain, he was our highest paid player last year because he's the sort of guy who can bat at four, five, six, where you don't have a lot of alternatives. Uh, whereas if you're batting, talking about the top three, like there's, there's like 50, 60 guys around the world uh, who can bat at an exceptional level batting in the top three. And we got him uh, last year for that uh, number four, five, six role. But he did, couldn't get enough game time because like our top three, which was Colin Monroe, Luke Ronke and Shadab, they all ended up scoring 250 plus. So do you, he suddenly, the guy you'd invested so much on because uh, he was so much better than the alternatives, that he was not being used at all because of how good your top three was and it's not his fault. So then the end of the season, you look at his numbers and the average is 30 at 150, but uh, the, where was... Was there enough impact for him to win those games? Those are the decisions that you need to make. Like the one thing that we are, uh, Rehan and I are really lucky with is like complete confidence and support from the ownership group, so which allows us to basically uh, give guys tasks during the games, during the tournaments, knowing that come next season or come two seasons from now, uh, it'll still be relevant. With like with a lot of franchises, like I talk to a lot of like, data guys around the world and guys get hired for a single season and you can't really inculcate that idea in a player or in a team of like playing a certain way if you're just there for that one season and if the player knows that his own position is more secure than the manager or the analyst then uh, he doesn't really have the motivation as such like it's a completely human impulse to like you can pretty much ignore him knowing that Next season, that guy might not be there. But whereas the, the lucky thing that we have is uh, since like PSL 3, uh, we had pretty much everyone in Pakistan cricket knows that Rehan and I will be at Islamabad United. So it's sort of like, the, if you want to stay at Islamabad, if you want to play the way that Islamabad plays, you have to listen, listen to us or you'll end up another franchise. So a lot of that has to do with like the human relation and the, the conditions of basically franchise T20 cricket. Yeah, so one of the things that came up uh, a few years ago was how, uh, you know, some coaches were saying that uh, captains actually don't want too much of intervention during the <laughs> game because then it becomes an accountability issue. And, yeah. you know, if they, if they for, uh, don't follow it and, uh, you know, then if they follow it, and, uh, mm -hmm. you know, it's not, uh, it becomes, it's hard to know who is accountable for this. Is it the captain or is it the coach? <laughs> have you, have you felt that often? I mean, uh, and is there a case for the game to be entirely guided from the, uh, beyond the boundary? Like it is often in baseball with all the signs and all that. Or uh, you feel that there is still a role for the agile captains to change things around in the spur of the moment? So, so yeah, so we've had like, we had Mispa as the captain for three years. And then we had Dino as the coach for four years. And then we had Mespa as the coach. So we've always had like this, like Dino wanted to micromanage everything Dean Jones. That is Mespa, when he's out in the field, he uh, always felt like there was like, uh, there was nothing that the someone could tell him from the outside that he didn't know already, which 
the irony of it being that once he became the coach, he was exactly the sort of coach that he would have hated as the captain because he was like there at the start. Now he's improved a lot over the past 18 months that he's been with Pakistan that he wanted to micromanage everything as well. And yes, the issue becomes like the accountability sort of thing. And even I have this urge, or Rehan had this urge of like, you know, trying to control as much of the game as possible from the outside. So the sort of like the thing that you end up with is something like uh, when you're bowling, you you give the captain all the data that you can, like you give them, you give him the data on like matchups, you give him the data on like phases of play, and then you let him run the show on the field because uh, only he knows like how the opposition is playing or how the pitch is playing. You can't, you can't judge the pitch from like uh, the dugout, let alone from a TV screen. And once you're batting, then uh, sort of like the coaches and the analysts sort of take control again because you, you can ha- you can give instructions on which guy to go after or uh, which phase of play to go after. Or like, as you mentioned, with the flexible batting order, which is like, whom do you send in uh, next and like stuff like that. Like, I think that's sort of like the uh, middle ground that we've come up with, which is, uh, that the batting is controlled from essentially the dugout, but bowling is controlled by the captain on the field, which you can have all the data in the world. You can have all of that entire thing. But one of the things that in cricket uh, compared to like, say, baseball, the one big difference is that you need to empower the guy on the field. You need to let him run the show as he wants to, whether that's, uh, whether it's a batsman batting or whether it's a captain leading his side, he still needs to control that team because if he's constantly looking at the dugout, of, uh, constantly looking at the dressing room, then he might not get the same level of respect, but also he might not get like uh, the level of control or the level of understanding that you have. Plus, the other thing that you have to remember is like, if you've got somebody like a miss by, if you've got somebody like MS Dhoni, like I look at the way CSK play, somebody like that, you going to every game with like a 10-15 run advantage just because of the amount of knowledge or the, the amount of understanding that the captain has. And uh, Mespa was injured in one of the games, I think 2017 or 2018, one of the ESLs. And he was sitting next to me and uh, the guy, Ruman, was captaining in his stead. And there was a batsman batting and he just saw the first ball of the over. He saw that the fine leg was up and he immediately said, why have they put fine leg up? This guy, uh, he'll play the first ball normally, but the second ball, he's going to go over a short fine leg, and which is exactly what he did. And I asked him later, like, how do you know that he's going not going to go after it on the first ball and he's going to go after it on the second ball? And he's like, because I've played cricket against him for like 10, 15 years now. And I mean, those are the sort of things like the one thing that we're still short on is like situational awareness. Like how does someone play if uh, fine leg is up or if third man is up is you still don't get those numbers in your like Excel files or stuff like that, right? Yeah, yeah. That's a terrific point. And uh, that uh, instinctive awareness is uh, something that you want to trust in the players and the captains because they have played uh, for many years and they've seen things that uh, maybe the uh, video hasn't picked up or things like that. But uh, one point, last point about batting though, um, why, I mean, I, I find it baffling. Maybe you can explain it. Why aren't teams retiring batsmen? Why is this not <laughs> becoming like a common thing? No, honestly, I mean, Dean Jones, yeah, and, and your I, own, understand. I mean, the late Dean Jones used to think that that's a yeah. great uh, strategy. But uh, he himself, I think, said that he found it difficult to do because of this whole, uh, you know, players were not on the same page. He wanted to do that like every match that he ever played. There was at least one <laughs> instance of him wanting to retire a batsman out. But that's the thing, like I talked to like uh, analytics guys around the world. And a lot of them talk about how someone wasn't listening to their, them or someone wasn't. Uh, didn't follow their instruction that I feel like we've reached a stage of analytics in cricket where everyone's got like not pretty much the same data but like 80 to 90 percent of the same stuff like everyone has like phases of play and like lengths and which ball to ball whether it's a googly whether it's a leg spinner you want to ball left arm spin massive data you pretty much everyone's got everything the thing that it comes down to is how you're able to treat these cricketers how you're able to translate that data into 
uh, translate that data into like cricketing lingo. Like that's the thing, like that's a sort of thing that we've sort of prided ourselves on it. And that's the thing with like uh, retiring batsmen as well. The thing is that at the end of the day, this is still a human being. This is a cricketer with a career on the line. And if you retire him once, especially at the start of the tournament, you're basically giving him the message that we don't back you. We don't trust you to go big if need be. If I if I am going to retire someone for, say, Andre Russell, then maybe that guy might understand. But even then, there's like a massive ego hit that he'll, he'll have, which is like, you're pretty much telling someone that they're not good enough uh, at a certain stage, right? Every cricketer, the thing that you have to remember with cricketers is the thing that I've come to realize over the last five, six years is that if someone's come through like uh, club cricket and district cricket and like first class cricket, gotten to like uh, a PSL level or the national team level, every step of the way, what they've always had is guys doubting them, them needing to prove them wrong. And what every single cricketer that I've always ever had, the one thing that you'll always uh, see with them is like, an almost superhuman amount of competitiveness because like to get through, especially if it's a Desi and he's been through the entire uh, Desi system, like if it's an Afghan or a Bengali or a Pakistani, the, getting through that entire system to even get to that level, the, the entire, his entire uh, being is built upon this idea of proving doubters wrong, right? So then what they want is at, at least from within the dressing room to have that complete backing and control and if you end up do retiring someone that basically means you're shattering their confidence but at the same time it's also like it just needs like a couple of teams a couple of coaches to do that like you saw that with Sunil the Sunil Narayan thing like it used to be the case that uh, some if we were sending someone uh, if we were changing batting orders in which send uh, worse batsman in before a better batsman in the better batsman would get pissed off because he's like, I'm going in at number six or number seven, whereas this guy who's not even as good as me is batting above me. There's, there was that ego sort of a thing. But once Sunil, you saw that, I think it was in the CPL first and then the big bash, people started using Sunil Narayan at that. Then in the PSL, then KKR had him play that role. And then so you started having other franchises around the world trying to get their guys playing that role. And suddenly, by the time we got Shadab batting at number three, like no one within the team, one or two instances aside, no one really complained because it was like, they understood the role that he had. So it's sort of like the entire sport is a copycat sport. And once someone starts doing that, and I feel like the only people who can do that are, uh, in terms of like the power that they have and the, control that they have is either somebody like an Owen Morgan or somebody like a Virat Kohli with India or maybe the West Indies team, except the problem is that the West Indies won't do that because whoever their guy is, they don't need to retire him because if he's in the West Indies 11, he is good enough to hit out once he's in. That's the other thing. Like Retiring someone basically means that you're getting someone out who's already in and sending someone in who is going to start afresh, which is actually the hardest thing in T20 cricket to even right now. You still see guys struggling like the first five, six balls. Even the best hitters in the world struggle with that. So you might see that with, say, the West Indies, but as I said, the formation of their team doesn't really uh, lend them lend uh, themselves into that situation. They, they aren't ever in a situation where they've got someone in who's like not built to hit out. And similarly with England, like England might do that, but you look at that number one to number six, number seven, and like there's no one who's, who will ever require retiring as such. So then it comes to India and like, again, that's not a team that really requires someone needing to retire out, right? The, I mean, you, when you think about somebody needing uh, to get retired, you think of something like, and the Ajinkya Rahane innings uh, against the West Indies in the 2016 World T20. Except now, the the way the teams are being built up, you won't even have somebody like a Rahane batting in that 11. You might have a, a Yadav or an Ishan Kishan or somebody like that in that role. Who can hit out but, anyway? Yeah. Who can hit out whenever need be? 
Yeah, so which brings me to the reverse point, which is, uh, will teams start dropping catches more regularly to keep batsmen in rather than yes. uh, letting like an Andre Russell or someone come in? They do. They already do. Like, obviously, it's you, you don't say that. In, like, there's a lot of stuff that goes on, like, the... That you there's someone that you don't want wants to power play in the middle overs, for instance, you do want that guy to bat longer, like at the death. We've seen uh, when we had Andre Russell that he would drop catches of our batsmen, knowing that the fewer balls that Andre has to bat, the better it is for them. So I think a lot of stuff that already goes on, but you can't say that like in public that we dropped someone deliberately because like that considering <laughs> cricket's history of like the past 25 years of like cricket's history with corruption, like ah. there's so many questions come up in that case. So you can't really say that, but uh, I mean, that's another thing like Dino was ahead of the game at where he would say that uh, he would use the word tactical drop. Like you, 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 you do use that sometimes. And I, I feel like, a, and now I, when I'm watching a T20 game, sometimes you can see uh, when someone is doing that deliberately, but I mean, those are the sort of things that already go on. So, how is it done? Is it uh, uh, do the fielders uh, make sure they don't uh, get to the ball quick enough, or do they? I mean, how? It's a very. It must be a very subtle thing then. Yeah, it dep- Again, it depends on the who the fielder is. Like, uh, if some if it's somebody who's like a T Twenty franchise, like you know, one of the freelancers that play around the world, then you'll see you'll see like. For instance, West Indian guys, uh, even you'll notice during the IPL, I don't know if there's that many guys playing this year or not. But again, as I said earlier, those guys are always ahead of the game. Those guys are the smartest when it comes to those things. And you'll see those guys sometimes not attempt a catch, sometimes drop a simple chance of a batsman who's trying to hit out and is not really succeeding to do the, uh, su- su- succeeding at doing that. But like with a lot of guys, if you if you got a like a Pakistani guy, if you guy if you got like a youngster, he's not going to do that. But because in his mind, it's still he's still fighting for his place. He's still fighting for his position, and like one cash drop might uh, build a reputation of him being not a good fielder. So the only guys that can afford to do that are guys who are like established in their position. Which again goes back to the thing that I was mentioning earlier. Like a lot of the things even right now in T20 cricket are defined by the individual and the, his status within the format and within like T20 leagues around the world. Like that defines a lot of how much leeway that he has and how much uh, he's going to experiment or he's going to be willing to uh, do things that are completely out of the box. Interesting. So, okay. So, let's. Uh, we've spoken quite a bit about batting and strategy. Now, uh, in terms of bowling, I want to know. You know, one of the quotes that you gave again to Tim Wigmore in that piece, which I linked to, was your bowling plan must simply be what the batsman doesn't want. Nothing more complicated than that. Yeah. And uh, and you figure out what a batsman doesn't want from uh, looking at video analysis and data. I'm assuming, right? Uh, yes, but it's also like like. I mean, I can say that because like there is, there's no secret to it. Our plan in the, I mean, it's however much I want to look at it as a different format or a different sport altogether. You think about the way that our uh, opening plan A uh, in the PSL that just got postponed was that within the first three overs, what was our strategy? To ball top of off stump, fourth stump line, uh, out swing with like a slip in place. Like at the end of the day, the basic, the fundamentals of cricket still succeed because everyone's technique and everyone's style of play is built upon a foundation of uh, like red ball cricket, right? So that's your plan. Your plan is to start off, whether that's the power play, is to go for like a, a red ball line, essentially, a red ball length. And once you're outside of the power play, then it comes down to matchups. If, if, if you've got like a guy who struggles against left arm spin, you'll go a certain way. If you've got a guy who uh, struggles against leg spin, you'll have... So you have like six or seven options. You have a left arm spinner and leg spinner, whatever the case. You try to have an off spinner as much as possible and you try to have a left arm seamer as much as possible. But even then... Uh, 
the data you can't follow that blindly you have to be uh, you know like proactive in that and see because a, a guy might struggle against a certain type of bowling but he might also be working on that in the next and you might uh, get him like someone somebody might struggle against leg, leg spin for instance and your data says that but uh, imagine there's six he's been off for six months playing uh, due to covid and he, back home he's just been playing leg spin so what do you do with that like i remember i was talking to a batsman not with our franchise but but with another franchise like i helped out a lot of guys at other franchises with the data like in the off season because if someone wants my help like i'm uh, more than willing to help them with that but i remember there was this pakistani batsman uh, who asked me about his uh, data breakdown and I looked at it and i said to him that he struggled against and he told me rather that he struggled against a certain type of spin bowling so then i took out his data and his numbers over the previous two years against that type of spin bowling he was averaging 116 and i was like i obviously swore at him and like told him like <laughs> what, what is wrong with you like if you're averaging over 100 against uh, that type of uh, bowling why do you think that way and he mentioned to me that like the three four years ago this was the type of bowling that he really struggled against so the since then every time he goes home when he's playing club cricket or when he's doing nets at his club back home what he does is he has like if he has a one hour session of batting he bats normally against everyone for like half an hour and the, the other half an hour he bats against that type of bowling because that is the one that he struggles against but obviously over the two three four years of consistently doing that over and over again had improved him without him actually realizing he still thought uh, the way like that I struggled against this type of bowling so like that's the thing that data can show you which is that the how your uh, net sessions and how your practice sessions uh, can be improved or if something is already uh, reached a level where you basically in his case what I told him was that he needs to get back to a normal routine because like he's just he's maximized the that thing that type of bowling and anything that he's going to do after this in the net sessions would be like almost like counter, counterproductive to him and then once the death over comes in again again like the power play it's sort of like it uh, you, you go after the matchups if you've got uh, like a lot of these elite hitters struggle against leg spin so you try to have like one over spin uh, you save one of them for like the part for the death overs but also like beyond that just go back to your plan a which is like if you've got somebody who there's not a lot of guys who are going to be able to hit like a perfect reverse swing reverse swinging leg stump yorker for a, a lot of runs so like, if your bowlers are able to do that then uh, so be it but if they aren't then you provide them with like different plans so what is again coming to the measures of excellence you know i mean obviously you know test cricket has a certain way in which it has historically measured bowlers and that's yeah. you know uh, glen megra is perfect for test cricket in so many ways but a uh, glen megra mm-hmm. may not be perfect for t20 because if he, then well, if a batsman depends on how you use him yeah okay because yeah. no but what i'm trying to understand is like you know what is a good over like how do you know what is a good over you have to are you looking at you know looking at the batsman and looking at what the uh, plan versus execution is or mm-hmm. are you looking at uh, the you know there because are you looking at the actual uh, uh, ball as a stand alone or are you looking at it as a result i'm i'm little confused there so it depends so like within the tournament you look at it from like the plan execution perspective which is you give someone a plan if uh, if he executes that plan and still gets hit by a boundary then it's not his fault it's your fault but if he is not executing that plan that then it's his fault so you know like every single ball every single match up that you have like you've given the instructions on that's the first thing and it's not just like the way you uh, bowl but also like with like 90% of t20 cricket you can pretty much see what's going to happen just based on uh, how the field is set up right like if you if you have got like a, a mid wicket long on square leg or back then it's going to be into the stumps probably a cutter you, you still have the advantage of having your you know like a lot of those are things that you sort of learn as you go along 
So that's the first thing that you look at. And then the other thing that you look at, like uh, once the tournament fish finishes, you want to retain guys or you want to get new guys. And then you compare like the overall data. So it's uh, what is a good over is dependent on uh, whether you're batting first or bowling first, whether you're uh, it's a day game or a night game, whether it's a uh, power play over, middle over, however well it is. So like Crickwiz has this, thing of they use, I think it, they use true run rate or true strike rate or something like that, which takes into account what the the average player would have versus what the uh, equivalent guy would have. And you have a plus and minus attached to it. Ah, okay. Yeah, I think I've so, seen that. Yeah, 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 yeah. So, yeah. So, we've got our own model for that, which is uh, like, obviously not for public use, but we, we know like uh, when, if you... So if you're playing in Lahore in a day game in the middle overs uh, and eight run over or in nine run over in some cases is a good over from the bowling perspective. Whereas uh, for, from batting perspective, rather, whereas in Pindi or 10 run over might be an advantage for uh, like the bowling unit. So you you look at the the one thing that we've been lucky with is that uh, the first four years the PSL was in, like we had only, I think, a couple of games in Abu Dhabi, pretty much everything else was in Dubai and Sharjah. So we could apply a lot of the things from that uh, where mm, not a lot of other franchises around the world are able to do that. If you're playing the IPL, if, you, if you're playing like at eight, nine different venues, you can you can judge your guy at your home ground, but away from home, uh, you don't, I, as you mentioned earlier, you don't just don't have the sample size, which is big enough for that. Whereas with us, like uh, if you got like 10 games or 12 games all in Dubai and Sharjah, like seven or eight games in Dubai, all of them night games, then you've got like a big enough sample size to judge whether something is a good over or not. The simplest thing to do is like you look at what the average, let's say an average left arm spin bowler goes in the 12th over in Dubai. you got that number, right? And then you yeah. have your left arm spinner bowling the 12th over. So if uh, it goes at like 8.2, like the number off the top of my head, like the average economy rate th- there is 8.2, then eight and under is a positive over it, and anything over it is a negative over. It's like, it's a But at the same like time also, there could have been an edge that went for four. So you have to f- budget that in as well. So yeah, absolutely. So what, the other thing that you look at is like we had we used to have this thing with Muhammad Irfan, for instance, like uh, because Rahan uh, would always take out. Uh, he noticed this in PSL one, and he took out those numbers later, which was like the majority of uh, boundaries that Irfan conceded in the two PSLs that he had with us were top edges over the slips or the keeper because like his extra bounce. And in the power play, someone goes hard at him and he ends up conceding all those runs because edges, which is like the traditional way to look at it is he was unlucky, right? Whereas we might look at it in the way that if he's getting the edge over the keeper, it is his length too short in that case. Like even if you're getting that edge, was it because it was a good ball or was it because you're bowling like... Somebody like Irfan, if he balls slightly back of a length, gets that top edge behind the keeper, looks really good. The commentator would say he's unlucky, he's won the battle, but like the person won, won the war or whatever else cliche they're going to come up with. But does he need to ball at that length where in Dubai for instance? So you look again, like the first thing that I mentioned, the plan versus the execution sort of thing. I don't, if I got an Irfan, if, if I, I got a guy who bowls, uh, who's got that level of bounce. You, I don't want him bowling like back of a length on the slow pitch. I want him to pitch the ball up. So like then the plan and the ex- execution, those sort of things come into it. Yeah, that's that's uh, interesting because then the bowler immediately has to unlearn all the years in which he has been told what is a good ball and what is not a good ball. And I think that sort of uh, adjustment uh, plays a big role among people. I mean, a, a classic case is like a spinner, right? He gets an inside edge uh, and it goes uh, past the keeper for four. I mean, it's a good ball. It's, he has beaten the batsman. But at the same time, whether had he bowled another length, whether it mm. could have actually just gone for a single, that is the question to ask, right? 
yeah i mean and it also depends on like the guy who is batting if you're getting the if you then again it goes back to what your strategy is so if you got a spinner who whose aim it is and whose role is it, it is to go for wickets so who's going to take chances to go for wickets if he's getting an edge to the boundary he is doing his job whereas someone who's whose role uh, is a containing role if he's getting an edge is that necessarily a positive thing because if you are in say containment uh, containment mode then you probably won't have a spin in pl- uh, a slip in place rather for you so like what's the point of you trying to get that edge you you're far better off trying to attack the leg stump of the uh, batsman rather than the outside uh, edge of the batsman and you mentioned like the unlearning thing like that that's the biggest challenge that you have like that's also the reason we look at like trying to get uh, guys you know like 17 18 19 get them in into the dressing room into that mindset and like uh, before the tournament starts i have like a one hour conversation with every new guy that comes in basically my entire aim is to try to make sure that they they can unlearn as much uh, stuff as possible like not just with like the the way that you the lens that you're going to bowl or the lines that you're going to bowl but how you think about that your game as well like as i mentioned earlier like whether it's a batsman or whether it's a bowler the thing that you really struggle with is like trying to make sure that he's playing for the team rather than himself like you immediately realize like if someone is going for his stuff or if someone is going for his strategy like uh like you might see every other commentator talk about like a bat a bowler needs to give the ball some air a spinner for instance whereas his role might be that he needs to bowl like flat and quick and if he is going to flight the ball then that basically means he's taking a chance to try and buy a wicket for himself even if that's not the team's requirement so there's there are cases when someone gets someone out and after the game i still sit him down and i'm like yeah it worked this time around but that's not necessary you know and success it might not be successful in the long term yeah that's precisely what i feel uh, you know is a fundamental difference between the you know two formats i mean test cricket and to a certain extent one day cricket is a team sport that is played by individuals so you know <laughs> yeah. an individual is still looking for his personal you know success like a batsman may be playing for the team but at the end of the day he is also trying to maximize his excellence but yeah. in a t20 the problem is when you try and maximize the excellence and if the team is suffering then it's no use so i think a t20 requires everybody to be on the same page even if it means to actually not perform to 100% of what they think is performance absolutely absolutely and and you have to buy in to uh, buy in but this is the thing that we always tell our guys which is we had seasons where somebody might score 200 runs and in another franchise uh, he might have scored 300 runs but he gets selected for the national team based on those 200 runs because we won like we're the only franchise which has won like multiple psl titles so if you win if you play the playoffs you play the same final you play the final you get, even if you get like a 35 of 25 balls in that that gives you more mileage than getting like yeah a, you have visibility yeah yeah then getting a 17 a round round, round robin game right so like yeah. that's that's how you sell it to them which is that basically if the team succeeds then they they'll need less effort to get their just rewards and the, as much as my job is to do uh, to deal with data analytics it is also sort of like a uh almost like a sports psychologist sort of a thing where you so, sort of need to understand every person his motivation the his life story and like try to maximize on that front and he, even a lot of time like you look at somebody like even Dale Stain like i remember like last year the our last game i sat with him for like an hour and an hour and a half and my entire concern was that we brought him in pretty, precisely to get us power play wickets which was the thing that he'd been really good at in 2017 2018 2019 he's been the best in the world in 2019 but he wasn't doing that for us and i remember him saying to me that uh i was trying to hold myself back because it's a new franchise so i wanted to um not go after wickets as such that i uh, as the leader of the attack i need to it's better off if i go at like four hours one for 30 than 
uh, trying to aim for four hours, three for 40 and end up with like one for 45 or something like that. I remember telling him that like his role specifically, specifically was to get us wickets. I didn't care even if he went at 60, there's four overs. If he got me like three or four power play wickets, he was doing his job. But like, how, how did uh, Dale Stain respond to that? Was he perceptive? Was he, did he have any concerns? What did, how did he respond? So he, he took it like in his stride, like the, the tragedy of it was like, he, he said that uh, he, he didn't realize like he was given that much leeway and like he was now, uh, he was pumped up for it. And then he pretty much said like between the lines that don't worry, I'm going to win you the next game. And by the time the next game was happening, he was on a flight back to Joburg because COVID had hit <laughs> by that stage. Yeah, yeah. But like, <laughs> so, so that's the thing like, uh, and again, it goes back to having those human relationships with all these guys. Like, some say somebody like Andre Russell, the best time to talk strategy with him is like at 3 a.m. in the hotel corridor with him having a cooler with rum in it. Like, you can talk, he'll listen to you then far more than he would listen to you like in a net session or something like that, for instance, right? And even there's so much that you learn from all these guys. I remember the first PSL, the first time we had like the first couple of net sessions that we had. And I remember watching like Miss Bow or Shane Watson batting and they'd come in and they'd have like a 15 minute session of like normal net sessions of like batting of like cover drives and forward defense and all that stuff. And then they'd had like 10, 15 minutes of power hitting. Whereas you had Andre and Andre would not uh, do the a normal batting session, if you could call it that, he wouldn't play a single ball, uh, what you would consider like along the ground or something like that. Whatever ball he faced, he tried to tear the leather off of it. And I remember like joking to him, like, Andre, you're like almost 30 now, you might need to learn how to rotate the strike. And him saying to me, like, uh, I don't need that. That's just not my role. Like, if uh, the, the ball is there to hit out, I'll hit it out. I might get out, I might not get out. If I'm going to bat in the final 10 hours of an ODI or the final five hours of a T20 game, I don't really need to uh, learn how to rotate. And like that like opened my mind on a lot of things like what you want to inculcate and what you want to like teach these guys, that doesn't come from like you go into the game and you just tell him that do X, Y, Z. It needs to come from like the way they prepare, the way you're preparing in the next session, to how his batting sessions have been. If you are, so for instance, if you are looking at somebody, the next game you're going to bat up the order because uh, the other team has like two left arm spinners and you're good against left arm spin. Then the two net sessions beforehand, that guy needs to have like half an hour or more against your left arm spinners, just getting his eye and getting used to that sort of thing. So, Again, it goes back to, as I mentioned with those West Indian guys, like the way they prepare, they prepare everything that happens on the field is something that you've prepared for in the net sessions or you've prepared for in the fielding sessions. Yeah, so uh, the question I had in terms of strategy, I mean, this is very interesting because, you know, what you are saying clearly means that, you know, the everything has to be as per the individual and not necessarily, you know, you also you have to look at each one's background and each one's mindset. So uh, you also said in that, uh, you know, piece that you said, uh, you know, for example, you said if somebody like Darren Sammy is batting, mm -hmm. then you may either bowl him spin or if it's pace, then it has to be length or bouncer because you don't want to bowl him Yorkers because uh, his technique is geared towards Yorkers. So you have like obviously specific plans for specific batsmen, mm -hmm. but, but given all these plans, suppose you're, the bowler follows all these plans and still mm -hmm. gets hit. Then what is the, what, what, how is the response like from both you and the bowler and everything? Well, in that case, it's like you give him a pat on the back and you t tell him, well, bold, hard luck and just try it again. But uh, in a lot of cases, it's like he has his plans, you have your plan and you sort of have this negotiation of uh, sometimes it will be like, follow my plan if it doesn't work then you still have the fallback option of your plan, right? Where, and in some other cases, it might be, okay, do what you want to do, do what uh, like feels natural for you, do, follow your strength. And if it doesn't work, then the backup is my plan, which is from the data, which says X, Y, Z, right? 
So you always have a plan A and a plan B and how you're going to negotiate that depends on the bowlers, depends on the conditions, depends on the batsman and stuff like that. And if either of them are not working, then it's like you go to the captain and you're like, save him and save me essentially, right? Like, <laughs> yeah. And with a lot of Pakistani guys, it's uh, pre- pretty easy because it's like, if his plan doesn't work and if my plan doesn't work, then he'll just go in and try to bowl as many Yorkers as possible because that's just something that like when... Uh, when in trouble, bowl a Yorker. <laughs> when in trouble, bowl a Yorker, yeah. And you see that like a lot of times, like even within the power play, if a team is like 50 without loss after three overs, the guy who comes in to bowl the fourth over might start off with like three Yorkers to start off with, which is counterintuitive because like the white kookaburra is going to swing for like three or four overs. And if you're going to try and minimize that even. You know, that one has to also watch out about the breakdown of trust, right? Between the management and the player. Because, you know, suppose... The, no, but I'm That's saying, suppose, suppose you are giving a player plans and for three games it does not work. Then yeah. what if he stops trusting you? And he says, uh, he's just, this fellow is just talking nonsense. Yeah, that that's that's essentially everything. Like I can tell you, there might be like thirty other franchises around the world who might have better numbers than us. But the confidence that I have in being able to translate those numbers, especially to Pakistani or Desi guys in general, but I can I understand like uh, how a guy from Waziristan would think, or how a guy from Sialkot thinks, or how a guy from Lahore thinks. Like. Uh, it's you understand like, the backgrounds, yeah. You understand their life stories, you understand their backgrounds, you understand like there's a guy, you, you need to know what he was doing as a 14-year-old, the sort of relationship that he has with his parents and all of that goes into it. And the thing that I've seen, like I talk to other guys and they're like, I tell this guy X, Y, Z and he doesn't listen to me. It's like you need to have that relationship. You need to have... Like, I always struggle with, like, uh, foreign guys coming in. And I, what I try to have is, like, before the tournament, I have, like, a half an hour, one hour session with the guy trying to understand his mentality. I have, I usually have all his data with me and understand his cricketing perspective. But one thing that I've been, I am lucky with is, like, I can talk to most guys that are from, like, most places around the world about non-cricketing subjects, right? And that is where those relationships are built. You can talk to anyone about cricket all day long, but that uh, relationship, that trust factor is built on, like, like I remember talking to, like, yeah, since we mentioned DSTN earlier, I remember talking to DSTN about like a novel re- written about Karachi police in like 2014, 2015, and like narrating the story of that to him. Uh, then the next time I talk to him, there's like a, a different sort of a perspective that he has towards me or like the trust factor that he has. So those things that build like over years and over like the knowledge of how a guy uh, has lived his life, like say somebody like Colin Munro, he's got uh, all the data that he has and everything that he has, it's like A plus, but like, uh, so like two weeks before the tournament starts, I prepare like a, a several page report on every guy and I send that to them basically saying to try to understand their own game. Uh, more broadly and like if there's anything that they want help on or if there's anything that I can help them with and stuff like that and somebody like Colin Monroe he's like may there's just, there's just too many numbers and like I'm fine I'll just go out and play my game and you won't have anything to complain and it's like well th- that makes my job so much easier right whereas other guys you might need to tell them like this guy you need to attack, this guy you need to defend and all of that stuff. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, that trust factor is amazing and it's great. Uh, The point that you mentioned is uh, fantastic. It's uh, that, uh, you know, it's in the non-cricketing discussions that the trust and the relationship gets built up, which then can come a fuse in the cricketing discussion. Talking about which, uh, you know, tell us a bit about your, the scouting as well, because I know that uh, you have so many Mm -hmm. stories of these, uh, spotting these players and picking them. I think Shadab Khan is a very, uh, you know, as a thing that you have mentioned before, uh, you know, if you can pick out, like, uh, maybe talk about Shadab or a couple of examples and how you, you know, what you saw, you know, again, talking about measures of excellence, what you saw and what sort of uh, drew you to that and how you built that relationship with maybe like one specific example. So, I mean, I, I can use multiple examples. So, you look at like 
so one of the thing that the PSL has is you need to have one emerging player, and it dep- whether if you're going to go in with eleven guys or ten guys is dependent on how strong you are with that emerging player. And we've had I think like seven or eight of our emerging players go on to play for Pakistan. Even right now, uh, Wasim Wazir, who was who is our emerging player this year, he is with the Pakistan team in South Africa right now. Even though he's had like half a season of first class cricket and like. The PSL, he's played like four T20 matches in his entire career. He didn't even make his T20 debut before he played with us. But we didn't look at like if he has T20 experience or not. If he has the raw materials for that, then he's ready for it. But in Shadab's case, it was like, uh, I remember watching him in the Pakistan in the 19th World Cup. And like, I was like, fine. Like that, nothing really jumped out as such or anything like that, right? But then you looked at his, at his numbers and I remember the the under-19 regional tournament that had taken place. Like the second to the fifth highest wicket taker that season had between 17, 18 and 19 wickets and the highest wicket taker had 32 wickets. And that's the sort of thing that you uh, you look at the, the table and like you're taken aback by it because it's like if the difference is so vast, then there must be something right. So that's how, and we were pretty, pretty lucky because uh, there were six spots, like three other franchises had emerging spots before that because we had won the PSL the previous year. So we couldn't uh, have a high uh, draft pick as such. So we just retained our guys from the previous year, even in the emerging category, because it was like, we we're not going to have anyone good in emerging anyway. But we had him shortlisted that in case no one picks him up, which was what had happened. And then once the tournament started, we put him under Samuel Padri and Saeed Ajmal's wings. And then the other thing is, like before the to- tournament, we had we had a warm-up game against the uh, at the ICC Academy against the UAE national team. And he went for like three for 16 in his four overs there. So then we had a, an inter-squad game. And so I... Uh, was in charge of like making you know the the teams how two teams are built and stuff like that so I specifically remember uh, putting him in one team and the other team I had Misbah, Shane Watson and Shajil Khan all three in the other team because I wanted to see how he reacts to you know bowling to uh, elite hitters of spin which all three of them were at that stage and even in that game he went for like I think uh, 15 to 20 in his four overs. And once you've seen that, you're like, okay, then that means there's there's something that is working there. There's something that is like a little special there. Then you play him and like he's had, he had a huge uh, peak and then he's, he's had a pretty bad 2019 and he's sort of like recovering from that. And it's a, the, the other thing that you have to remember with a lot of like young guys is that there will be, uh, you know, peaks and troughs until someone's like 24, 25, 26. He is going to be inconsistent. And that's something that you have to be willing to accept and willing to uh, deal with. Like, that's why you have uh, experienced guys in the team. The, the job of the experienced guys in the team is to be the consistent guys, whereas the youngster is there. He might win you one game and he might fail in three games. But like that is to be expected. Like no one at 2022 20, is going to perform the way a 30-year-old is. And that's that's a difficult thing to accept when you're building a team. But like eventually you have to sort of realize that. So that's and as far as like uh, your initial question of what you're looking at, like if it's a fast bowler, I mean at the end of the day, I'm a Pakistani and like the one thing that I look at is if a guy is quick enough. If he's quick enough, like everything else is secondary. Pace like, is pace, the, yeah. Pace is pace, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> like, uh, I mean, the, that's the thing that I love about this format is that we've had this resurgence of like pace is pace again. Like we've, we've gone from like, I remember even uh, Seven, eight years ago, when, once I started covering Pakistan cricket, I remember there was this guy, uh, Ahmed Jamal. He was playing for Pakistan A because he'd won a, a speed speed gun competition. He bowled like 145 and like he Pakistan was really lacking that real quick fast bowler. And you look at like seven, eight years later now and I was 
just looking at something, uh, making something a few days back. And uh, basically there's like eight or nine guys in the domestic game right now who consistently bowl 140 plus, which is like, which only happened because like, because of T20, everyone wants to have, wants to have a Harris Rauf or a Mahmoud Asnan or somebody who bowls like close to 150. And you see the same thing in England, you see the same thing in India. And you're even starting to see that in the West Indies with O'Shane Thomas and guys like that, like uh, guys bowling real fast coming back in. So that's the thing that you look at once you're looking at fast bowlers, once you're looking at spinners, it's like uh, you're looking at the temperament and you're looking at how much variety he has. And if you're looking at batsmen, it's sort of like, I st- I'm still not really landed a batsman as such. And uh, sometimes something uh, is right and something goes wrong. So I trust the numbers rather than my eye in like batsmen. Okay. The interesting point about uh, bowling and fast bowling, uh, one of our listeners, and of course, he's also a, you know, column, he writes uh, for Quick Info and all that, Himanish uh, Ganju. He mm. uh, actually had a point. He said that, um, you know, he notices that uh, high pace at hard lengths is becoming a potent weapon at all stages of T20. It is not necessarily, you know, the uh, uh, beginning, middle end power play. He's saying that he's mm. seeing this, teams use this across, especially if they have a really fast bowler. Is that something that uh, you are noticing as well? I mean, we were doing that uh, the, even back in 2016, like, again, it depends on the resources that you have, right? So we had Samuel Badri and Mohammed Irfan back then. So we could use somebody like Mohammed Sami as like, we call it a middle over specialist, which is a guy who comes in to ball between the seventh and the 15th over and like balls consistently 140 plus 145 plus because he's trying to hit someone out at that pace. You might be able to do that at the death because like the risk reward uh, is completely in the batsman's favor. But in the middle overs, you, you're not going to uh, a lot of batsmen won't do that if someone's bowling hard lengths at 145. Trying to hit him out is like there's an element of risk attached to it. And he was using Muhammad Sami in that role the first couple of PSLs. And once we lost Rifan, then Sami had to bowl in the power play and we weren't able to get back to that. And that's a problem you have with a like a salary cap game, which is like uh, what you're going to invest on in resources depends from person to person. But if you are running a national team or if you're running an IPL team, for instance, because the IPL teams have so many more resources than uh, franchises around the world, then I feel like this is not even like an innovation that is like a necessity. You need to have like a mid-lower specialist fast bowl or somebody like, like Mark Wood or uh, I guess with India, I think they're going to try and use Prasad Krishna in that role the way at least the... The latest, uh, going by the latest series, but I, if you have a, a wicket taking leg spinner and a guy balling 145 between, say, the 10th and the 15th over, I think you're going to win way more often than you're going to lose. Yeah, absolutely. So, um, so the thing is that, uh, you know, in terms of fielding itself, um, and in almost uh, towards the end, especially of each game, but even in the middle of overs, there's so much discussion that goes on in the middle about the field setting and what they have to do, the captain is constantly yeah. with the bowler. How much of that planning happens beforehand? How much of it is also a lot to do with thinking on the fly? And uh, why is, you know, even today, after all these years, cricket seems to still resist fielding stats. I mean, we still don't know how good a fielder is. I mean, of course, now we have things like run saved and all, but even then, I mean, if I have to, if you have to uh, tell you how good a fielder is uh, Jadeja, you know, mm. I don't have like five, six things to completely like comprehensively prove that he is perhaps the best fielder in the world. Yeah. So like, the, because firstly regarding the feeling, I don't think that's a quantifiable thing because I, it, again, it the, the reaction to that is a behavioral thing. Like if you've got, if you've got Jadeja uh, feeling at say backward point, then the batsman is going to uh, no, try to like slice the ball more or like play towards cover rather than play towards backward point like I mean it won't come up in the stat as such but you can see that in the field you can see like oh the implicit uh, presence yeah 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 yeah. so like those are like those so you you just put like on your uh, sheet that you have with them you just put a plus there or you just like you have your internal sort of thing that you did well here but like 
with somebody like a Jadeja, with somebody like a Sharab, with somebody like uh, Fabian Allen, even a Glenn Maxwell, them not challenging their arms, them not uh, trying to hit a ball in an unnatural position because they want to avoid that period. Those are the sort of things that these guys end up affecting the game at. Like, no one is going to challenge Jadeja's arm. So, like, it might be a 50-50 uh, you, it's a single you're looking for a two in like 90% of those cases uh, that might be uh, a double but like with Jadeja you might not want to take on his arm but does that count as a run saved or a, does it not and that also allows the uh, bowler a lot of leeway because it's like a lot of times you just want if someone's going off and if someone is a negative matchup for you you just want to give them a single and get them off strike Whereas they'll always, on a good ball, they'll always look for a two so they can all be back on strike. And in those cases, having somebody like a Maxwell, having somebody like a Jadeja really comes into those sort of things. So, I mean, those those are things that are not really quantifiable as such. Again, yeah, absolutely. So, uh, yeah, to- to- totally agree. And it seems that, uh, you know, a lot of it is also... Uh, a bit of buying time, right? You also want to, uh, it's also psychological. You don't want to, you know, rush in and make a hasty decision. So you're giving Absolutely. the bowler a like, little bit of time. The way that MS Dhoni and Rafa Nadal and to an extent Novak Djokovic control the clock is like, honestly, like that is something that you need to learn more than anything else. You will never see Dhoni, for instance, yeah, you'll see him once his team is on top, once he's the captain, that uh, his spinner might go through an over in like 150 seconds, an entire over. Like before you know it, Jadeja or Raina is bowled an entire over. Once he's batting, if he uh, hits a boundary or anything like that, then you sometimes you see him immediately get back on strike. Sometimes you see the uh, stand away from the stance for like, what seems like an uh, eon and stuff like that. So the way you control the clock is one of those things that there's no quantifiable measure of it, but once you see someone who's good at it, then you immediately recognize it. Yes, absolutely. So, uh, yeah, let's uh, wrap up the discussion with one question I had. I mean, of course, the biggest... uh, uh, leap here is that uh, you know we, we uh, the grammar of uh, the sport and the grammar of the format is still uh, you know far behind where it should be. Television is still. Uh, I heard that day people are still talking about bowling a good length and all. I mean, good length. <laughs> yeah, it is just as if there is any good length in this. Uh, but uh, if you have to pick, say, one or two, you know, uh, stats or metrics that television can bring in and popularize more in T20. You know, what will it be? Will it be like, you know, shots attempted or will it be like, you know, of the, you know, there's a metric about, you know, resources remaining and overs remaining, mm-hmm. right? Wickets and overs remaining. Those, what will it be for you personally to see, to see the, to see it reach the layman so that it becomes mm-hmm. part of conversation? So the, the, the one thing that I look at is for like, say, batsman, it would be like balls per boundary. Because okay. your strike yeah. rate, more than your strike rate, that is representative of the sort of batsman that you are. Yeah, you can be like a Babar Azam or a Virat Kohli where you just don't play any dot balls at all. But from the 95% of uh, batsmen, the ball per boundary is the thing that defines a lot. But the other thing that I get really frustrated with like broadcasting and stuff like that is how contextless the stats are. So like... Uh, if I tell you that Lassen Malenga bowls, 65% of his death balls are attempted Yorkers. Is that a high number or a low number? Like, you don't know that, right? Like, what is 65%? What is uh, someone, you mentioned like how many shots attempted. If someone attempts like 35% of balls for like big shots, is that a good thing or is that a bad thing? The Malenga thing I mentioned earlier, like I was, I know this because I was uh, looking at Hassan Ali's numbers and like preparing de- death plans for him. And every major fast bowler in the world, he's attempted Yorker that the death is between 35 and 65%. Between two to four balls of uh, a death over are Yorkers. And on the surface of it, the difference between the, uh, someone attempting two Yorkers or someone attempting three Yorkers is minuscule, right? 
but that sort of if you have a context of what that actually means if someone has a an economy rate of say 8.5 with like 40% yorkers whereas someone else goes at nines bowling 60% yorkers does that mean that a yorker isn't that safe a ball uh, at the death or is is it because that guy isn't uh, as good at landing his yorker which goes back to what whether the 60 he's bowling too many yorkers like th- there's that entire discussion that comes into it and i don't think the commentators or the broadcasters want to go into that because especially in t20 cricket but generally in cricket but especially in t20 cricket they've dumbed the they've dumbed the game down they there is a hardcore audience that wants a detailed analysis which isn't really being provided as such yeah and i think i think it's well past the stage of attracting the casual fan now i think now <laughs> there is a critical mass of uh, followers for the sport who are looking for the a bit of depth and you know i'm not saying you have to make every single uh, uh, thing about uh, you know stats and thing there is also elements for human stories but at the same time i mean the the kind of coverage that you have you're still mentioning uh, you know average and all in t20 <laughs> I mean, come on at least I mean, move on I mean, from there I, 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 that's the other thing like we don't so for instance we don't use average anymore we use runs per innings because like having a not out in a t20 game in a in a four day game in a red ball game having a not out is like an exceptional achievement right yeah, having one it's the reverse here <laughs> having a one in a t20 game is like redundant like what's the point of that like yeah. you, if you are if you are averaging like 50 but your rpi which is like your runs per innings is like 35 you have like those michael bevan ms dhoni type not out if you are finishing uh, chases then yeah uh, there is like some value to it but you've got other metrics for that but have judging anything on average like you look at something even something as simple as the icc rankings like i mean my god the icc t20 rankings are like broken broken on a level that even the political system is not broken i feel like i think david malan became like a top 3 batsman after playing 11 t20 matches and we had uh, david with us and is uh, even i remember talking to him like just how insane his rise was but even then it sort of feels a little strange and now you've got devin conway is i think in the top 5 as well yeah he's in the top yeah <laughs> which is like i mean he's good and everything like but i mean if you look at that new zealand team you were you would have like williamson and cyphert and maybe if gaptel is still playing you would have them over them it's sort of like i mean sorry to go off on a tangent here but it's sort of like because people don't understand this game like one of the things that like, i feel like needs to be reiterated in commentary and like in discussion about the game is that between 50 to 55% of runs and usually around 55% of balls in the t20 innings are played by the top 3 right so how do you judge a top 3 batsman versus a top 5 batsman when their entire like the resources they have to present themselves to you know showcase themselves just aren't the same in a four day game in a red ball game the an opener and a number 5 will have different challenges because someone's playing a new ball someone comes in against the reversing ball for instance but your challenge is the same which is you you try to build a long deep innings you try to build a good enough innings and you know even in the odi game like the top four the top five have pretty much similar sort of roles but if you've got as i mentioned like 55% of balls are being played by the top so that basically means 11 overs of a t20 game will be played by the top three so the, if the number on average the number four comes in the number five comes in in the 12th over how do you judge his performance if he's only going if the maximum that he can bat is like eight overs so that's what half of it is 24 balls so if it's 24 balls that he has compared to someone who's coming in knowing that if he gets in he can bat the entire 20 overs like how can you weigh the, those two performances on the same scale yeah it's it's very tricky but you know i think uh, there are ways to uh, 
uh, definitely figure it out and tv can get out of their prehistoric <laughs> mode because that's the only way the language is going to reach the you know average fan and only then do people start talking about it and recognizing it and otherwise this sport will still be like you know stuck with uh, trying to compare it with uh, test cricket and one day cricket and it's never going to really move forward i mean of course it will move forward in the team space and the strategy yeah. space that you are working with but it won't move forward in the general discourse and that's going to be a shame because well, as, long as, yeah. as long as you have ex cricketers coming doing commentary unless it's the sky sports guys beyond that or if it's in bishop beyond those four or five guys you're still going to yeah you're still going to hear people say you have to put a price on your wicket you've got to put a yeah, and like every time you take a single after hitting a six that's apparently good <laughs> like more than anything as the thing that really frustrates me is uh, sometimes i'm looking at like highlights of rpsl games and you have like say shadab is bowling and someone doing commentary says shadab needs to give the ball some air give it some purchase and then you look at the game and it's like you look at mujib zadran you look at imad asim look at rashid khan rashid is probably the perfect example of that those guys really go under like 90 kph usually they're between 95 to 100 kph rashid bowls faster than any leg spinner has in like the modern game like people used to talk about anil kumble bowling flat and straight and like uh, kumble might as well be adil rashid in front of like the, the pace at which uh, rashid khan bowls but like you want uh, no one is going to say that rashid needs to give the ball some air right because like rashid is now a proven commodity but if someone new comes in and wants to bowl at that pace you'll hear the same guys talk about he's not giving the ball any air he's not getting a chance giving himself a chance to get a wicket which is like i mean that's the other thing like no one the one thing that i've uh, learned the most in the past 6 years is about t20 spin bowling and the biggest difference between uh, the way commentary is done versus the way strategizing is done the biggest difference is uh, spin bowling in t20 cricket the, the, like i learned a lesson which was that the difference between a guy bowling 95 kph and a guy bowling 85 kph is a bigger difference than a fast bowler bowling 145 versus a fast bowler bowling 130 a bigger difference in terms of uh, how batsmen react to it yeah bigger difference in terms of how batsmen react to it bigger difference in terms of how their rows are like no one's going to charge rashid because the pace at which rashid bowls and the length that he has you can't really afford to charge him is you you can't really slog sweep him because he, if he even if he errs he'll err on the shorter side so the, the slog sweep is not really an option as such unless you've got somebody like an andre russell who can just uh, overpower that ball but if someone is bowling like at the pace that mujib bowls at the pace that imad bowls at the pace that rashid bowls you can't charge him that's just they're pretty much like medium pacers and if you are going to charge them then that has to be a premeditated thing and like then you have to react accordingly obviously you've got like i mean the premeditated thing like the things that somebody like a, a, an ab de villiers does like <laughs> i've seen him do things which are like scarcely believable but uh the way like uh, spin bowling needs to be understood like samuel badri was doing this in the 2012 world t20 right the the new ball non spinning really fast yeah. power yeah. play specialist and it were like 9 years in and we still don't really understand his role or what he was doing so it's like i can't really have much hope with commentary on that front <laughs> all right so yeah maybe uh, you know it is uh, through these uh, tiny podcasts and discussions uh, maybe we can make a small difference and uh, yeah this has been amazing i've learned so much about the sport and uh, hasan thank you for your lovely insights cheers man cheers that brings us to the end of another episode of the 81 all out podcast if you enjoy the work we do please support us via coffee.com that's k o hyphen f i dot com slash 81 all out you can find the link in the show notes and it will allow you to either set up a recurring monthly payment or throw in a one time contribution also please subscribe on itunes spotify google podcasts or wherever else you prefer it would be great if you could leave a rating and a review so that more people can find us 
As always, we would love to hear your thoughts on the work we do. So please send us your feedback. India at home, launch goes wide.